Today's video is a tutorial for creating a spinner ring. Now this is not your typical flared end spinner ring, which I love, but I wanted a more masculine looking spinner ring. This ring is made with basically four rings. The base ring, the inside spinner ring, and two thin rings that encase the spinner. I labeled this as an intermediate tutorial because you need to be precise with your measurements, your cuts, and your flame control. It is a substantial and weighty piece when completed and is so satisfying when you get that spinner to spin. I'm not a professional jeweler, so there may be better ways to accomplish this. This is just how I do it. And you'll see that I do encounter a problem, which I often do, but I figure it out and so will you. The materials and tools I use throughout this video will be listed in the description. Hey Vector, are we gonna have fun? For the base ring, I am using 20 gauge sterling silver sheet. You can also use 22 gauge. It's best to find a piece that has a straight edge. This will help you tremendously later on. For the spinner ring, I use double half round wire, which is sterling silver. It's number 204. And all of my wire and sheet I do get from Rio Grande. For the end rings that will hold the spinner in place, I use 16 gauge square wire. And all of these are sterling silver. To add texture, depth, and interest to the spinner ring, I use texture plates with my rolling mill. I get these texture plates from OregonTrailSilver.com. She has new offerings every month and they are limited availability. And finally, we need silver solder. I like to use the wire silver solder. You can use sheet solder. I don't recommend paste solder, but I like to use the wire and I will flatten the ends um, using a chasing hammer. And to keep track of which is which, I bend the ends. I have one bend for hard solder, two bends for medium solder, and then three bends for easy. So that would be my order of operations. Let's get started on our textured spinner. First of all, we need to do some calculations. Yes, we must do math. Don't worry, it's just a little bit of math and you'll find that these are calculations you will use all the time, especially if you are making rings. I want my finished ring to be a size seven and a half but I'm making a wide band, so I'm going to make it a half size bigger. So that means I need a size eight. First, we need to find out the thickness of our 20 or 22 gauge sheet. I'm using a set of digital calipers and this sheet is 0.81 millimeters thick. We will use this thickness to help us determine how long to cut our ring blank. I use a reference for rings from Andrew Berry to determine how long to cut my sheet. I know I want a size 8 and I know the thickness of my material is approximately 0.8 millimeters so I can look at the reference chart and see that I need to cut the sheet to a length of 59.1 millimeters. To determine how wide to make the band, 
We will first texture the double half round wire. To determine how much of the double half round wire that we need, I take the length of the ring blank, which was 59.1 millimeters, and add five millimeters to that. Since I am making a size eight, that was sufficient, but I would suggest adding 10 millimeters if you were making a larger size. I had just enough material to make my spinner. I have determined that I need 64 millimeters of double half round wire. Now I'm adding a texture through my rolling mill and that will stretch the length of my wire. If you are not adding a texture, I would add an additional five millimeters on top of what you've already determined that you need. I'm gonna mark the length using my ruler and I'm using my flush cutters to cut this wire. This wire is actually a bit thick for flush cutters, so I really risked um, breaking my flush cutters, but I was too lazy to saw it. I would recommend that you actually saw that double half round wire, but I got lucky this time. Now that I have my double half round wire cut, I want to add the texture to it using my texture plate. Make sure you put the face side of the wire down onto the plate to get the texture on the correct side. To get the best impression, I use a piece of craft foam you can pick up at any craft store. When I place this foam on top of the sheet, it helps press that metal deeper into the plate giving you a great impression. Just cut the sheet to size so that you don't waste material. Before we texture, we must anneal our metal. Even though I buy my wire dead soft, just the little bit of handling can cause it to begin to work harden. To ensure you get the best impression you can, you want it dead soft again. The easiest way to know when it is annealed is to mark it with a Sharpie. As you heat it, this mark will fade away. When that happens, you know your metal is ready. So I've cleaned it off a bit. I've marked it with my Sharpie. And now we just light our torch and heat that metal up. So we want to brush the flame back and forth. We don't want to keep it in one spot for too long. We don't want to risk melting our metal. And you'll see it'll start to get like a, a darker color to it. This is just oxidation. And that Sharpie goes away. I usually turn it over and heat it on the back a little bit. And you can kind of see that glow kind of chases um, the flame. And I just wait a moment for that glow to go away and then I will quench it in water and then put it in the pickle for a few minutes to clean off those oxides. You want clean metal going through your rolling mill. Now it's time to texture your wire. I absolutely love this part, taking plain wire and turning it into something more interesting. Here we have our texture plate and don't forget the piece of craft foam that we cut earlier. Take your wire, position it onto your plate over the area of design you want to impart onto your wire. Remember the face of the wire should be face down on the plate. We need to determine how much pressure we need to transfer the texture. I start by putting just the plate and wire into the rolling mill and tightening down the dial until it holds the plate and wire in place so you can't pull it back out. Make a note of that position on your mill. Now loosen it back up, take the plate and wire back out. Put your foam over the top of the wire and make sure it is positioned where you want it. Sometimes this can be a little tricky. Put, the, put it back into the mill just before the wire hits the rolls. 
tighten the mill back to the mark you previously noted. From this point, I only turn my dial 1 8 of a turn to tighten it more, so 5 ticks from 25 to 30 in this case. Your mill may be different, so I suggest you do some test runs to understand how much pressure is needed for a good impression. Once you have it set, roll your little sandwich through the mill. And now you have texture. Now that we have our wire textured, it is time to measure the width of the wire. We will need this to help determine the width of the ring blank. Yep, math again. Use the digital calipers to get an accurate measurement. Close them down and zero them out. Make sure the wire is sitting flat in the jaws to get as accurate a measurement as possible. Once you have that measurement, make a note of it for future reference. We also need to measure the width of the square wire. We will need two of these. Zero those calipers out again and get an accurate measurement of the width of the wire. Make note of this on your pad. In my case, it's 1.37 millimeters. Since there are two, I write it down twice. And now we want to add all of those measurements together. I don't want to do this in my head, so bringing out the trusty calculator. Old school, too. So 5.4 plus 1.37 plus 1.37 is 8.14. So we make a note of that, 8.14 millimeters. I want to add 2 millimeters to that just to be on the safe side because I don't want to make the width of my band too small. So I'm rounding this down so I need 10 millimeters wide on my ring blank. I already know that I need a length of 59.1 millimeters and now I need a width of 10 millimeters. So 10 millimeters by 59 millimeters is the size of the ring blank that I need to cut out. To help us mark out the ring blank that we need from our sterling silver sheet, let's get a ruler and a pair of dividers. Set your dividers to 10 millimeters or 1 centimeter using the marks on the ruler. If your ruler is like mine, there are little indentions you can feel as you adjust your dividers. Very helpful to set them to the right size. Now that your dividers are set, find a section that will be long enough and using the straight side of the sheet, run the dividers along the side and scribe a line. You may want to run your dividers several times to scribe a deep enough line so that you'll be able to see where to saw later. Now that you have your line scribed, you can use your ruler to mark the length that we determined earlier. Use a scribe to place a mark at the right length. If you have a small square, use this to help you scribe a straight line where you mark the length you will need. You want this line as straight as possible. Now that you have your marks, it is time to cut it out with your jeweler saw. 
time for the dreaded task of sawing. Seriously though, it's, it's not that bad. Practice makes perfect. Oh, and good saw blades. Use a lubricant such as Pepe Lube or Beeswax to make it easier and to extend the life of your blades. The most comfortable position and ergonomic position is to have the piece at chest level. When cutting a straight line, I tilt my saw blade slightly forward to make it easier to stay in a straight line. Andrew Barry taught me that little trick and it is a very helpful and has saved me uh, numerous times. Sawing is not a race, so take your time, get into the rhythm of it, and be as accurate as possible. This will help you later. If you have a shear, you can try and cut the metal, but I find it very hard to get it perfectly cut. I usually have one end more narrow than the other, so my preference is to use the saw. If you have a gu guillotine shear, yeah, guillotine, <laughs> this would be the perfect job for it. So just relax, saw, meditate maybe, but just get into the zen of it and you'll be done before you know it. And just for reference, I'm using a 3 op blade in my saw, which is written 3 slash 0. You can find references online to see which sizes you can use, depending on the gauge of your metal. But you want at least 3 teeth coming into contact with your metal. A finer blade does not necessarily mean a smoother cut and will drive you insane because it takes so long to saw. After we finish sawing out our ring blank, spend a bit of time filing the ends so they are flush and straight. We want to form this into a ring. You can use a number of tools, but I have several pliers that make it this easier. I prefer to use my half round and flat pliers to ease the metal into a rough circle. Start at one end and begin to form a circle. Switch to the other end and also begin to form a circle. Continue to work around the ring with the goal of bringing those ends together. You want the ends to meet flush with no gaps. Solder will not fill gaps. You want the edges to be lined up and not to have a step from one side to the other. Time spent here will make it much easier when it comes to file later on. There are other tools you can use to assist you with forming the ring, like the ring bending tool made by Pepe Tools. I have one, but I'm not using it for this video because many of you may not have one. It is a very handy tool though. It saves me a lot of time. Just continue shaping the ring and working on lining up those ends. Once you get it nearly formed, you may find you still have a gap. You can push the ends over each other to build tension so the ends stay together. Just make sure they are aligned as perfectly as you can get them. Once you have everything lined up and you're happy with it, we can take it back to the bench and I'll show you a little trick for getting the perfect join. It's time again for some more sawing. And this one is much easier to do. You take your ring and you hold it firmly, locate where that seam is, and saw straight through the join. Depending on how well your ends line up, this may take several passes to get the seam to line up perfectly with no gaps. This will provide you with a much cleaner seam and your solder will flow beautifully. The hardest part is getting the saw blade back out once you get that sawn all the way through. It's actually easier if you thread the saw blade through the ring and then work from the inside to the outside, but I'm known to be a bit stubborn so I went from the outside to the inside. Either method will work. 
Before I solder, I like to add a barrier flux to my pieces. This will help prevent fire stain, fire scale, and I highly recommend doing this each time you go through a soldering operation that could result in you heating the piece for an extended amount of time. It's just a solution of denatured alcohol and boric acid and you just dip it in this solution. You'll have to stir it really well because it does separate and then you can either just set it aside and allow it to dry and it'll leave kind of a crusty white finish on it or you can set it on fire and you see this gorgeous green flame and that's just a quick way to get that barrier flux uh, to dry and ready to use. Now that I've applied the barrier flux, I'm going to get this set up to solder. Since this is the first soldering operation for this piece, I'm going to use hard solder. And I begin by cleaning my solder wire and I have flattened it so that it doesn't roll away. I just cut a small snippet and place it on a section of the block that is fairly flat. I usually put it a little closer to me too. So I get that positioned and then I need to apply flux to the seam of the ring. I know we have already applied a barrier flux but now I just need a regular flux uh, to encourage that solder to flow. And I'm using handy flux here so I just put a little handy flux on the seam only. And then position that piece over that solder chip. And this works really well for soldering any rings closed. And you want that solder chip to prefer preferably be positioned on both sides of the seam if at all possible. Now I just light my torch and I begin by heating the entire ring to warm it up. And once that ring is warmed up a bit, I start to focus on the seam itself. And I'm trying to coax that solder to flow up that seam. So you see me brushing the flame up away from that solder chip. And when it comes to temperature, then you'll see that solder flow and the ring will kind of drop down a little bit. I usually go to the inside and just coax it through the seam to make sure that I have a really good join. And now the ring is ready to quench and place in your pickle. Now that your ring is soldered, check it to make sure that you have a strong solder joint, that the entire seam is filled with solder, and then you want to clean up any excess solder on both the outside and the inside of the ring. Taking care not to remove any additional silver from the ring, you just want to focus on removing that excess solder. Now that we have it cleaned up, it's time to shape the ring. We want to use a steel ring mandrel and a rawhide or nylon hammer to shape it. We don't want to stretch it, so we don't want to use metal hammers. We just want to shape it. So concentrate on the bottom edge of the ring and shape one side, then flip it over and shape the other side and keep alternating sides of the ring until you get that ring flush against that mandrel. Now that we have a perfectly round ring, we need to focus on flattening the edges of the ring. 
So get a coarse piece of sandpaper and with the figure eight motion, sand the edge of the ring until you get it nice and flat. And then you can flip the ring over and sand the other side. You don't want any kind of step from one side to the other. You want to make sure they're both nice and flat. Now it's time to make the outer rings that go on the outside of this band that will hold your spinner in place. So take a bit of time, use your digital calipers to measure that outside diameter of your ring. And then make note of that measurement on your pad. For my ring, that measurement is 19.8 millimeters. So we'll mark that down. And we want to get the square wire that we're going to use. And you need to measure the width of that square wire. The width of my wire is 1.3 millimeters. So we add 19.8 to 1.3 because we need to allow for the thickness of that square wire. That equals 21.1 millimeters. Now we times that by pi to get the length of the wire that we need. So that'll be 66.29 and I'm just going to cut that at 66 millimeters. I just use a standard ruler that has metric measurements on it to measure the length of wire that I need. But I need to start with a nice straight edge. So just using your flush cut pliers, cut that end and then straighten out your wire so that you get a proper measurement line that up on your ruler and I use a scribe to just scribe a line where that cut should be. So line it up. Make your mark. and then use those same pliers to cut that wire to the length that you need. And you'll need to repeat this process for your second ring. Follow the same process that you did for the larger ring and shape those smaller rings into a circle and work on aligning those ends and applying tension so that those joints stay together. If needed, saw through that joint for perfect alignment. Once you've achieved a perfect join on your rings, it's time to solder. So again, I use hard solder and I just place my solder snippets on the charcoal block I'm not using a barrier flux this time because they're smaller pieces so they'll heat up quickly. Just brush your handy flux on, set them down on your charcoal block so that your solder is on both sides of your join and then heat them up until that solder flows and then just quench and pickle the pieces. Now that our rings are soldered, it is time to clean off any excess solder, shape them, and then size them to fit snugly onto the wide band we soldered previously. As we did with the band, use your steel ring mandrel and a rawhide or nylon hammer to shape the ring perfectly round. We don't want to stretch it at this point, just focus on getting it into a perfectly circular shape. When working on a ring mandrel, because of the tapered shape, 
you always want to flip the ring over and work on the other side of the ring to ensure it is evenly worked on both sides. Once you have the ring shaped, we need to make sure the ring is also lying as flat as possible. Often you will see a slight wave to your ring, especially in thinner bands. Place your ring on a steel block and use your hammer and tap all around the ring. Flip it over as you tap around the ring and work on getting the ring as flat as possible. Further refine the ring by sanding both sides on a piece of coarse sandpaper to sand down any high spots that may remain. You want to do this on a perfectly flat surface. If the ring is flat to begin with, this shouldn't take much effort. You should be able to see any high spots that remain after sanding. If you do have high spots, take it back to the steel block and hammer around the ring again to try and get it flat. If it doesn't want to budge, anneal the ring and try tapping it flat again. Finish up with the sandpaper. Once we are at this point, we need to check to see if the ring fits over the outside of the ring band. If it is too large, you will need to saw that ring open and remove some metal to reduce the size. If you have to do that, obviously you will have to solder that back closed and repeat the process that we just went through. Mine is slightly too small, so I take the ring back to the ring mandrel and hammer the ring to stretch it slightly. I'm still using a nylon hammer because I don't want to stretch it too quickly and I don't want to mar the surface of the ring. I also file away a bit of the material from the inside of the ring. I repeat this process until I can just fit the ring over the band. Remember you want it to fit snugly. You shouldn't have any gaps between the small ring and the larger band. Now we need to solder this ring in place. We are back at the bench at the soldering station and I do want to put a barrier flux on this ring because of this heavier band. It will take longer to melt this solder so I want to avoid any fire stain which is the reason for the barrier flux. And once I've dipped it into the solution, I either need to let it dry naturally or I can just put a flame to it and evaporate all of that denatured alcohol and that leaves the boric acid behind as the barrier flux. Now that I have it prepped, I am going to use the medium solder to solder this small band onto the larger band. We've already used hard solder on the large band and hard solder on the small band. So the next solder that we want to use for this soldering operation is the medium solder. I always like to clean up the solder with a piece of a scotch Brite pad and I have flattened the solder on the steel block so that it doesn't roll off of my charcoal block, but I just need to cut a number of snippets to go around the top edge of that ring. So you need to use quite a bit. So I'm just cutting some small pieces and placing them on the charcoal block to get ready to place them on the ring. But first I need to put a flux around the ring. We have a barrier flux, but now we need a flux that's going to allow that solder to flow. So I like to use handy flux and I just apply that all around the top of the ring where those two pieces meet. And then I go back and pick up all of those solder pieces and just place all around the edge of the top of that ring. Now I just come in with my flame and I start by brushing it around the ring just to kind of heat it up. I'm not actually putting the flame directly on those seams yet, um, but I'm heating it up kind of from the outside. And then I start to 
dip it into the inside of the ring to get the inside heated as well. I just keep brushing that flame around that ring, trying to heat it all evenly. And what you're wanting to watch for is that solder start to melt and flow down into the seams between those two rings. Make sure you keep that flame moving constantly. You don't want to stop and keep it focused on, at one point for too long because you will melt that ring, especially that smaller ring. So once we have it all soldered, then we just let it set for a moment so that it's not glowing red anymore. And then we can quench it and then we want to pickle it for at least five minutes to get all of the debris and oxides and flux removed. Here we are with a nice clean ring straight out of the pickle. The next step is to get a piece of coarse sandpaper and you want to work on the side of the ring where we joined that smaller band to the thicker band. The purpose of this is to get rid of any seam lines so it should look like a solid piece. If the sandpaper isn't working fast enough for you, you can use a flat file. You can either file straight across the ring or lay the file down and then rotate the ring as you push it across that file. You want an even finish all around that ring. Once you are finished with the file work, go back to the coarse sandpaper to remove any file marks that were left with your flat file. Once I have finished the rough sanding, then I take a 400 grit sanding stick and I will sand the inside lip of the spinner ring and this is just to remove any scratches from the ring and then I will move on to the outside ring and do the same and then I'll also concentrate on the outside ring to get it nice and smooth and I usually take a flat piece of 400 grit and run that along the edge to remove any scratches from the coarse sandpaper. And once this is done, then I'll switch to 1000 grit sandpaper to remove any scratches from the 400 grit sandpaper. And then I have another sanding stick and I repeat the process with the inner lip of the ring as well as the outer ring. And this just gets it ready to put that inside spinner on. I get a nice finish and I remove any scratches since I can't do that once I get the spinner in place. We are back to our calculations. Yes, there are a lot of calculations with this ring, but it is easy math, so don't fret, you can do this. We need to determine the size of the actual spinner ring. It will not be the same size as the outer rings we just created. It will be a tad larger than those to allow the ring to actually spin without tension. To create the spinner portion of the ring, we need to start by determining the outside diameter of the center of the ring band. My ring is 19.61 millimeters. So we'll make a note of that measurement. So 19.61 millimeters. Now we need to determine the thickness of the double half round wire that we previously textured. To get a good measurement, straighten out the end of your wire before you take that measurement and you want to use a good set of digital calipers so that it's accurate. So now that we've straightened out that wire, we just take that measurement 
and the thickness of my wire is 1.25 millimeters. Now we add the diameter to the thickness. So I get my trusty calculator. So 19.61 plus 1.25. That gives us a measurement of 20.86 millimeters. We take that and we times that by pi, which is 3.142. And the exact diameter is 65.5. From here, I round it up to 66 millimeters. And I want to allow a little more material so that it is free spinning. So I add another one millimeter to that measurement. The length of wire that I need for this spinner is 67 millimeters. Before we cut the length of our wire, we want to square up the end. Using a square, just like we did with the wide ring band, we use a scribe to mark where we need to cut. You can find these squares in a variety of places. I actually made mine using my laser cutter. You can also use a miter jig or even a pair of parallel pliers to help you get a straight line. Using my scribe, I mark a straight line and use my snips to snip off the end of the piece as close to the mark as possible. If the snips don't cut through the wire, then you may need to use a saw to cut through that. I then use a flat file to file back to my mark to make sure that end is flush. I remove any burrs that remain on the back side of the wire. Once my end is flush, I use my metric ruler to measure out 67 millimeters and scribe a mark. I use my square again and repeat the process. As with the other rings, I use my half round and flat pliers to turn the ring round, line up those ends, make sure they're as flush as they can be, add some tension so that I close up any gaps, and then I'll take it over to the bench to saw through that join to get a perfect join on that seam. Once everything is lined up, I will solder this ring together using the same process as the others. I won't show that here uh, for the sake of time. Now that we soldered our spinner portion of the ring, check it to make sure there is no excess solder on the inside of the ring. If there is, take a moment to remove that excess solder. We want to go ahead and shape the ring. So using the steel ring mandrel and a rawhide or nylon hammer, follow the same steps as before to shape the ring into a circle. You don't want to stretch the ring at this point, simply shape it. You should not use a metal hammer because you will stretch it and you will damage the texture we applied to the ring previously. Using a finer cut file, work on removing any excess solder on the outside of the ring. You want to work carefully, taking care not to remove any or very much of the texture. You want it to be difficult to tell where the seam falls, and if you are lucky, your texture will flow from one side to the other. This is especially true if you are using a compact, detailed texture or simply no texture at all. Using the same file also work on the inside of the ring. Now that our ring is shaped and filed, it is time to check the fit. Slide the ring over the open-ended band to see if any adjustments need to be made. If it is too tight, work on stretching the ring like we did with the end ring. If it is too big, saw the seam open, remove material, solder it back together, and repeat the shaping steps. In this case, my ring fits just as I want it. 
It spins around the band and there is not too much play. Let's make sure the ring is nice and flat. Put it on your steel block and use your hammer to flatten it. We don't want a wavy spinner. Make sure you flip it on the other side and repeat the process. Once you're happy with the shape, spend some time with your sandpaper and files to further refine the ring and clean it up. I use a variety of sandpaper and sanding sticks to get a nice smooth finish on the inside, the outside, and the edges of the ring. It is more difficult, if not impossible, to do this step once it is captured in place on the larger band. Check the fit of the spinner again, make sure it spins freely, and make sure that everything is lining up nice and flush. Time to work on the last ring that secures the spinner in place. You will need to clean it up, solder it, and fit it like you did the first edge ring. Once you have it fitting, place it on the top of the ring and repeat the process for soldering the ring in place. There's a fine line between using enough solder and too much solder. If possible, leave a small gap between the spinner ring and this edge ring so solder does not freeze the spinner in place. For this last soldering operation, I use Easy Solder. As before, apply a barrier flux to help prevent fire stain. Apply your flow flux, in this case handy flux, around the top of the ring where it meets the band and then place solder chips around the top edge of that lip. Follow the same procedures by slowly heating around the ring to bring it up to temperature. Once the solder flows, immediately take that flame away. Let it cool a moment, quench, and then pickle. Inspect your piece to make sure the last ring is soldered in place securely and check that the spinner spins freely. Sometimes a bit of solder will get under the spinner ring, but it usually doesn't get under the entire piece since it is a floating ring and not a snug fit. That was the case for my ring. To fix this issue, I put the ring on a ring mandrel and used a pocket knife to pry the spinner loose. I put the knife between the spinner and the outer band and gently tapped it down with a nylon hammer. I slowly worked around the ring and repeated it on the other side. This was enough pressure to release the spinner. Be careful not to tap it too aggressively or you will misshape the ring. Now we need to remove the excess so the last ring is flush with the band. To do this, saw around the band using your jeweler saw. Don't try to saw through in one go. Slowly work your way around the band, sawing a little at a time. You will need to make a number of revolutions around the band to cut completely through it. It's time to get the sandpaper, sanding sticks, and files out again. We're in the home stretch and nearly complete. Start with a flat file and sand off any edge left from the inner band, rotating the ring around as you go. From here, you can progress to a coarse sandpaper to remove the file marks made by the flat file, and then progress to a finer sandpaper to remove those marks. Just as before, you want to try and make the outer band seamless with the inner band.
You can use your sanding sticks to work on the outside of the ring and wrap sandpaper around a wooden dowel to work on the inside of the ring. You want to spend a bit of time here to get a nice smooth finish before polishing. The ring has a very sharp inner edge that is not comfortable to wear. I like to use a deburring tool to remove the sharp edges from inside the ring. You can find these at just about any hardware store. Just run this tool around the inside and it does a great job at removing that edge and rounding it over slightly. You can repeat this to get it even more rounded. After using the deburring tool, use your round sanding stick again to smooth it out. Once you have finished all of the sanding, your ring is ready to polish and add a patina if you want. If you have a texture, adding a patina will make the details in that texture really pop. Here's how the ring looks after cleaning it up in an ammonia soap solution and a jeweler's brass brush, after polishing, and then adding a patina. I provide the recipe for the ammonia solution in the details section below. I go into these subjects in other videos, so I chose not to include them here. I hope you give this style a try. It is fun and a bit challenging, but it gives you a different twist on your typical spinner ring. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and be sure and subscribe to see future videos. Thank you for joining.